Okay, today is the 21st of January, 2010. We are at the New York State Military Museum and Veterans Research Center in Saratoga Springs, New York. My name is Wayne Clark. Sir, for the record, would you please state your full name and your date and place of birth, please? Stanley R. Gordon, G-O-R-D-O-N. I was born in Amsterdam, New York on the 17th of April, 1925. Did you attend school in Amsterdam? Yes, I did. I went. I graduated from the Wilbur H. Lynch High School, senior high school. And what year did you graduate? 1943. All right. And do you remember where you were when you heard about the attack on Pearl Harbor and what your reaction was? I absolutely remember that we were hanging out. It was a Sunday afternoon in a candy store up in where we all kind of hung out. And we heard about Pearl Harbor. I think we were listening to a football game. We were just doing something. We were just kind of hanging out. We were like 16 years old. And uh, we remember, and uh, you know, some, you know, I don't know, 16, you know, didn't get affected too much. But it was on our mind. And I remember walking down the street, going home, and, and my folks talking about the Pearl Harbor. And everybody said, you know, where's Pearl Harbor and all that stuff. I kind of knew where Pearl mm -hmm. Harbor was. But, but that's about it. We remember the day. And then I remember the day, the next day, they assembled us on a Monday morning, they assembled us uh, in, the, in the auditorium at the high school and so we could listen to President Roosevelt give his talk about uh, the date which will live in infamy mm -hmm. speech. Did so you, that, I remember that very vividly also. But then after that, it was, I was still in high school. But did your life uh, in the community change at that point with rationing? Or? Yeah, we all wanted to do our part. I remember I went over and wanted to sign up and be an air raid warden. They said, you know, you're too young. And they can't I do something? Well, you know, I don't know. I, I try to be, you know. Mm -hmm. And we, uh, and you know, we were involved in rationing. You know, but we were still kids. But then when we got to my senior year in high school, they, they wanted us to work in the mills because the mills were we were doing military, you know, we were doing blankets and canvas mm -hmm. at the carpet mills in Amsterdam. They converted over from carpets to that. And so I remember they, uh, they let us out at 1 o'clock in the afternoon on, so that we could go and work four hours a day in the factory to help out. Mm -hmm. Of course, we got paid. But we, we, as because we were miners, we couldn't work more than four hours a day. And I remember that. We worked in was kind of, you know, we were having a good time. In a way, it was nice to get out of school and go over and we felt like we were, I guess we felt like we were doing something. Sure. <clears throat> and, uh, and we did that during school. And I remember that summer vacation, that summer 42, which was the last summer before I went into service between my junior and senior year. I worked in a car, but no, I, you know, and we mm -hmm. worked. And everybody was involved. I remember they had a big ceremony at the, uh, at the carpet mill, and I think it was 42 or 40, where they got the E for excellence. Remember you said okay, the E yes. for excellence thing? I remember, you know, there were all the people kind of big. <clears throat> but remember, I was still a young guy, and I remember, remember those things, but I'm not sure how much I was affected. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, it didn't affect my life. So, you know, I had a girlfriend, you know, who did our thing. And that's, that's about it until the day came when I graduated from high school, and a couple of weeks later, I was in the Army. Now, did you enlist or were you drafted? I was drafted. And fortunately, the way that turned out, I went, I was, we went down to Camp Upton. <clears throat> there was a whole bunch of us from Amsterdam, and I remember at the uh, railroad station, there must have been 10,000 people there, you know. Mm -hmm. And the guys of our high school kids, mostly high school kids going in. And uh, I can't remember how big a gang we were, maybe we were 30, 30 guys. I remember going to Camp Upton and getting there, and uh, I remember the first night or the second night was the longest day of my life because they put us on KP, and I, oh, that was such a long day. And it was, it, do you remember these things, you know? And it happened oh, yeah. to be, we were at an MP barracks, and the MP barracks, or MP mess hall, rather, and that's the worst place to do KP because these guys are coming in all the time. You didn't have, you know, breakfast, dinner, supper. So we were, I was on pots and pans. If anybody's in the service knows, that's the worst thing you can do. Oh, yes. So I think we pulled KP the first three days in a row. I mean, I don't know what it, you know, I'm, at least two days ago. So one day, it was early in the morning. We were getting off of KP. We were going back to our barracks. We were marching back. <clears throat> Some guy come out of the barracks and he says, hold these guys up. And so we all stopped and turned around and said, how many of you guys want to be in the Air Corps? Says, what's this? You're going to ask us something? At the time, I, you know, I'm not sure. Uh -huh. So he says, never mind. 
all you guys come in here, we're going, we're going to do a test. So they gave us a color blindness test. Yeah. Okay, all you guys that, call, play, that pass the color blindness test, you're in the air core. Just like that. That was it. <laughs> Next thing I know, I was in Miami Beach, Florida. We're doing basic training. They gave us a bunch of tests. Am I going on too far? No, 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 that's fine. They gave us a bunch of tests, and they, they, uh, uh, my IQ was pretty good. My, uh, my reflexes were pretty good. They said, well, we're going to send you, to, we're going to make you an air cadet, and we're going to send you to cadet school. At least, maybe you can't be a pilot, but you can at least be a navigator. Mm -hmm. on Great. That's, you know, that's okay. Now we're down in Miami Beach. How could, it's, it's, now, was that your first time away from home? I mean, like that far? Or, yeah. 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 Well, of course, we camped in the mountains when I was yeah. a kid. Yeah, that far, sure. And uh, so we I got through a basic training. I remember about the last, it was, I pulled KP on Thanksgiving Day. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was about the end of my basic training. I think about a week later, or two weeks later, they put us on a train, and where did they send us? Syracuse, New York. Oh. <laughs> and I was in, what was it called, a, a, a training detachment, a, a CTD, what the heck was C? Anyway, it was for cadets. See, Pat Arnold thought that anybody who was going to be an officer in the Air Corps, you know, mm -hmm. the Army Air Corps, had to be, had to have at least college education. So what they did is they gave us six months of college education. And so before you could go to cadet school and really become, mm -hmm. become an officer. But in the meantime, uh, they were gearing up for the Battle of the Bulge. And so they decided, after I was there about five, five months, almost to the end of my tour, at Syracuse, and they decided that uh, they didn't need any more officers, they needed people to go fight. I mean, it was, the crunch was on. Uh -huh. But of course, I didn't have any, uh, I was in, I was still in the Air Corps. And a lot of the guys that were at the training with me had, were, guys that had transferred from other branches of service. They went transferring to the Air Corps. And a lot of them were from the artillery or the, or the, or mm -hmm. the infantry. And so it was funny, the day that they said that the commandant, who was a colonel, he said, the gravy train has left. <laughs> he said to us. And so we're out there standing and says, that is today you're no longer cadets and you're going back to your, to your wherever, you know. And so we all went out, went out for, uh, and uh, rolled out for roll call the next morning. And all the guys that were in service before, they all come out with their chevrons and everything, and their ribbons. We didn't know half the, well, you know, they, uh -huh. because when we were in cadet school, you were, sure. didn't wear anything. So that was kind of, of course, I was still 18 years old. And so they shipped um, our bunch and the guys, some of the guys they went, and, actually, to go backwards, when, I, when, I, when they took, the, took us out of this group and we come back from KP, a lot of us were from Amsterdam. Mm -hmm. We were in that same group, and a lot of us, when, a lot of us uh, ended up down, oh, we ended up in Miami Beach as a gang. Mm -hmm. But then there were only three of us that were out of the bunch that, that were drafted from Amsterdam, ended up at Syracuse. Yeah? And then the three of us, and two out of the three of us, ended up at Tyndall Field, Florida, at Gunnery School. And that was in, uh, that was like uh, June of 44. Mm -hmm. And so you see, that was about the D-Day thing. It was pretty close, so. And so I remember spending D-Day down at uh, Tyndallfield, Florida, the train. How much further we want to go? Oh, keep, keep going right to the end of your military experience. Okay, so I went to gunnery school. I, I, I uh, graduated, or uh, well, what do you call it, uh, as a, uh, a top-tier gunner. Uh, now, now, did you actually fly down there? Oh, yeah, yeah. You took a lot of flight, but not a lot. At first, you just went to school, learned to take the... 50 caliber gun apart, mm -hmm. blindfolded, put it together, blindfolded. I mean, you knew more about that gun than the guy that invented it, I think. <laughs> and then, of course, you, uh, toward the end, you went on a few missions, they had some B-17s on there, uh -huh. and they took us over to Apalachicola, which is not too far from Panama City. That's where Tinderfield was. Mm -hmm. And uh, we strafed things in the Gulf, and that was my first experience in a bomber, and it was a B-17. I remember we were flying only about 500 feet off the was. And so after that, they uh, I graduated, and they uh, and they gave us a delay on and oh, and then it so happened that the class before us got sent into B29 schools, and the, our class went to B24, and the class after us went to B29s, 
And we were kind of ticked because we wanted to go into B-29s because that was the big thing. Mm -hmm. Little did I know that I was so fortunate to go into B-24s, which I'll tell you about later. Okay. So anyhow, the day you sign it, you say, you're going, we're going, you're going to go into B-24s mm -hmm. and you're going to report to Lemoore Field, California. But in the meantime, we're going to give you a delay on route, which you're, I, I don't know if you're familiar with that, you know. So you'd go home. So then I could go home. So okay. I went home and, you know, did the thing, said hello, hugged everybody, kissed everybody. And then I took a train out of Schenectady and uh, we ended up in, I can't, can't think of the name of it, it was Lemoore Field, California. I can't mm -hmm. think of the name of the town it's close to. And then from there, we were, so there, that was called the 4th Air Force out there and they had operation, three operational training bases, one in Walla Walla, Washington, one at March Field, and one at, uh, it was in the desert. I can't think it was near a bounded air school. I was in a Victor Bell or something. Okay. So like, I was fortunate, again I was fortunate, they sent us to March Field, which is the country club of the Air Corps at that time. That's where Cap Hap Arnold happened to have his headquarters at one time. So they sent us down there for operational training, or sent me down there for operational and I got to meet the rest of the crew. And that's where they put the crew mm -hmm. together. And they were from all over the place, and then our officers, and everybody was trained. So we got together, and I got to the bunk, and I met the rest of my crew members, and uh, and we were family after that. Mm -hmm. and, uh, we flew a lot. We flew a lot at Marchfield. It was operational training, and I remember a lot of accidents. A lot of guys uh, died while training. In fact, I found out later that uh, about 17,000 Air Corps guys were killed just in training. Wow. Yeah. That's why there's a statistic that there were more people, more guys killed in the Army Air Corps in World War II than in the Navy and Marines together. Mm -hmm. That is if you lump in the ones that were killed in training. So there was a lot of casualties. Okay. Of course, a lot of guys, when the bomber crews went down, it was 10 guys in one shot. Sure. So then we, well, we trained at uh, March Field, and there was intensive training. We did a lot of flying, night flying, day flying. I mean, bombing missions also mm -hmm. over the desert. So, and then uh, we got to know, and then we, when we got out of operational training, we were uh, sent to Hamilton Field, California, which is up near San Francisco. <clears throat> and there were, we were going to be assigned to a theater of operations. And we got the assignment for the, for the Pacific. So we waited for them. We were supposed to ferry a brand new B-24 over to over to Pacific, to some bond, or well, over to, it was kind of a staging station at Nadzab, New Guinea, mm -hmm. uh, which is near LA. So we waited there for a while for a B-24 to come in from, I think it came in from Detroit, you know, Willow Run, they were to work, where they were building all the B-24s. And um, we got the air, we were there about almost a week, and then we were, oh no, the transfers, I'm sorry, the transfers from, from uh, Hamilton Field over to Fairfield Susan Airport. I can't think, I think that's called Vayner, I'm not, not sure what it's called today. It's Fairfield Susan, it's two towns. And that's where we're supposed to pick up the airplane. So we're there for a couple, for, no, not a couple weeks, maybe a week at the most. Mm -hmm. And I remember when I was there, a friend of mine that I buddied around with in high school, or in school when I was in, he was in the Navy and he was in Vallejo, and he was a corpsman at, uh, at, uh, at the hospital in Vallejo. And he, and I got to, I got to his telephone number because I knew it was, a, and I got to meet, we met at a, mm -hmm. at a, at a bus station in Vallejo or someplace. Mm -hmm. And we kind of talked over a time, so I'll tell you about that later. And so then, 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 then I remember going, it was, uh, I remember taking off in the airplane and we're flying over the Golden Gate Bridge and off we went. So what we did is we hopped from there, I'm, is this story in sure. sequence? We hopped from there to, to, the, to Hawaii, and mm -hmm. then we went from Hawaii. Well, what was that oh, uh, we flight taking, like? Well, the flight to Hawaii was, you know. On, you didn't get the, lost for no incidents? Yeah, no. The, okay. next, the, next, the next leg, we went, we were supposed to go from, the, I think, I'm not sure where, Wheeler Field or Hickam Field, one or two. <clears throat> and then we were supposed to fly from there to Canton Island. And Canton Island was a little, you know, a little dot. And then we found out that when we were around the year that we were lost. <laughs> <laughs> the navigator lost his bearings. So the pilot said, we'll get there, we'll home in on the radio beacon. So we got to Canton, and that was the lousiest place in the world. The, 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 uh, the uh, 
quarters for uh, transients. We were transients. Mm -hmm. We were terrible. I mean, we, and so we opted to, it was a nice night, we opted to go out the airplane. We slept on the wing of the plane. That yeah, was so terrible. Or, uh, yeah, I don't know. So I remember at the, well, I'm not sure I put this in my story, but anyhow, at the, uh, they had a theater there, which was, which was, it was an open air theater on the call. Mm -hmm. I remember seeing a movie there. It was a Sunday dinner with a soldier. And it was with John Hodiak and his future bride, Ann Baxter, was in it. And it was a story about a gunner on a P-17. <laughs> and so we got a kick out of that. So it was okay. And so then from there we went to, I think it was the next hop was to the Fiji Islands. Mm -hmm. And that was wonderful. Those people were so great. And the mess hall was immaculate. We went in there and everything, it was, everything was wood, but it was polished white. You know? And the Fijians are the nicest people. And then from there, we hopped over to New Caledonia. And from New Caledonia, we stopped at Townsville. And so at Townsville, I'm not sure if we picked up a different plane or what. It's a little hazy. But we spent about four or five days in Townsville, Australia. Mm -hmm. And uh, before we went all because No, I think we kept the same plane. We were supposed to deliver it at Nads at New Guinea. So we, but I'm not sure why we stayed in Townsville for four or five days. Anyway, but I remember the, the, everything, every meal was mutton. Mutton, mutton, mutton. <laughs> and it was, oh, I don't know. So I remember going to a movie there, and, I, and we walked into a bar, and you know, and the first time I had warm beer. <laughs> and I walked into this bar, and I recognized this guy. And I went, tapped him on the shoulder, I said, are you Billy Schroeder? And he says, yeah, how do you know? I says, well, we played basketball against you guys. I mean, I didn't play anything. But Amsterdam had played against you guys, and you played with Mount Pleasant. He said, yeah, and he was a basketball star at yeah. Mount Pleasant in Schenectady. So great, you know, you're the guy from back in the state. And so we kind of talked after a while. So there's a little more to the story. Anyway, so then we finally ended up, we went over to Port Moresby, and then we flew over the Young Stanley Mountains to, uh, to uh, Nadzak. And there we were as supposed to be as... We got it, we flew a few missions just to show what it was like to drop bombs on the actual people. You know, mm -hmm. Or an installation driver. And so we flew three missions out of there and uh, we were assigned to a bomb group. We, we were assigned to the 90th bomb group and so, were, so they put us on a plane. I forget. Well, we flew our own plane. No, we didn't. We flew a plane anyway. And the bomb group, and we flew to a place called Aoi. We stopped at Hollandia first. We went to Aoi. See if I can get this straight. <clears throat> From there, it said, "Okay, you got to go to the 90th bomb group because that's where you're assigned." So, so in the next two weeks are a blur. I'm not sure what happened. Or next week, somehow some army screw up, and we didn't. Somebody told the pilot that the 90th bomb group is on Leyte. Leyte. We just well, we didn't know that. You know, we had, we were still fighting on Leyte. Mm -hmm. So uh, we we ended up on Leyte. I'm not sure how we ended up on Leyte. But anyhow, the 90th bomb group wasn't there, but an advanced echelon of the 22nd bomb group was there. So they said, oh, you're here, you're in the 22nd bomb group. But there you are, it's raining, it's muddy, and it's, there's no airport, they're trying to build a strip, and they were trying to build a strip there for B-24s, you know, so we could start mm -hmm. up the road. But we stayed there a couple of weeks and it was horrendous. They put us on duty, of course, we enlisted men, we were on work duty and we are we were digging latrines and we were digging for water and we were doing And so one day they told us that, uh, that there was a counteroffensive and the Japanese had dropped some paratroopers. Oh boy. And we were, and oh, when I, we got to Leyte, every night we spent in the foxhole because we were kind of between the uh, artillery and the infantry. And the, the artillery was just lobbing them. Mm -hmm. And we, we watched them uh, shoot at planes, and, you know. The, the Japanese were harassing us. Well, not harassing us, they were trying to get us off the island. So I remember and then I pulled, and then the night that they said they dropped the paratroopers, we all had to pull guard to them. And, we didn't, and so all we had was a 45. So you don't do too much with a 45, especially those 45. So they, they issued us carbines, which is the next worst gun in the world. So what I answer, I but you had a tip. So we, why, we, they put us on, I put it on perimeter perimeter guard. So way off, way off and it was so dark you couldn't see an hand in front of your face. Is Mike too long with this story? No, not at all. 
So I'm pulling guard duty. I got the 12 to 4 in the morning shift. And the, uh, and the uh, password is strawberry shortcake. <laughs> That's because they thought the Japanese couldn't stay, say strawberry. So while I'm out there, you know, and I'm, you know, I'm, I'm still a kid, you know, I'm, you know, I'm reminiscing and stuff. So all of a sudden we hear some shots. Oh my God, everything, the birds are singing and everything, and it's black at night. Some guy down four or five hundred feet away said, Corporal the guard, Corporal the guard, you know, that's what you yell yeah. at. And so then more shooting, and then all of a sudden, quiet. And they couldn't hear it. So I went back to my sitting. <laughs> I would leave where I was sitting, and I figured what I was sitting. So then in the morning, the guy came to uh, relieve, and he came up, and he says, uh, So I go, What's the password? And he said, Strawberry shortcake. So I know it was okay. So I went back to the sack. And so the next morning, he got up and said, What was all the shooting about? I said, I don't know, some guy saw some, heard something and he started shooting. <laughs> the, uh, the story was that all they found was a dead boa constrictor. <laughs> so they don't know if that was if that was, that's what they shot. Anyway, so the next morning, now they, they, they put us on the, on, on the two and a half ton trucks and they hauled us back to Tacloban. Now, if you are aware of Tacloban, was a very important strip in, uh, in Leyte. That's where Major Bong was, and that was the strip. Mm -hmm. That was what we were trying to capture besides the island of Lake. So they got us back there and it was mayhem back there. It was, there were people, all over, guys all over the place and it was completely on the ground. It was raining and wet. None of us had changed our clothes. People, guys had dysentery, we had jungle sores. You know, it was just the horrendous living conditions. So finally, um, and, oh, and the reason they took us back there because our outfit was in the Palau Islands of the 22nd Bomb Corps. That's where they were stationed at that time to, to do the bombing. They were bombing the Philippines, and that's just, so they wanted to get us back to the Palau Islands. There were two, two, uh, there were two uh, crews that got stuck on this place in Galate, and so they, they a couple of beat, a couple of uh, C-47 showed up. We piled into one, and some other guys piled in the other one, and we we're supposed to go back to Palau, which is an island, you know, mm -hmm. not too far from. There. Philippines. And we got back okay, and but we found out that the other one got the other C forty seven got shot down. And they and they were guys from my group too. Or my group too. And of course they all perished. And later in years, forty, fifty years later, I got some letters from some of their relatives asking, Do you know anything about you know mm -hmm. because we have a website. The twenty second bomb group has a website. So anyway, so we got to to the uh, this is gonna be start to be a long story. Sorry. Well, I'm going to shorten it up. Okay, we got to the Palau Islands and I got a ter terrible case of dysentery and paratyphoid. Now, what's paratyphoid? I'm well, it's a, it's a form of typhoid, I guess. Okay. And it was all from the, when we were in Leyte, the, the, you know, I didn't get into that, but the conditions were terrible. We were, you know, the latrines were outside the trees. We were eating mm -hmm. outside and the rain coming down. We ate our mess kits and there were all these flies. And, you know, you had to blow the flies off your food before you get it in your mouth. And uh, there's stories about that too. But anyhow, we got to back to Palau's, and then I got this there, and they, they took, finally took me down, as I was, you know, it was big. They took me down to a field hospital, which they had on, on Ang we're on Anguar in the Palau. And they took me to a field hospital, and they got me back on my feet, and, but I was still on a liquid diet. I remember on the day after Christmas, they let me out, and I was, they needed me. I did go back. So I went back to, the, back to my field tent, and, and the crew, of course, had come to visit me a couple of times. So about two days later, I'm back flying, flying, flying missions. So now, what was your first mission like? The first mission was a kind of a training mission. It was off of it was out of uh, Nadzad, New Guinea, and I think we bombed a place on New Guinea called Wewak, and where they where it was one of those places where they bypassed, and the and the Japanese were still there, but they were kind of starving and. I think we were, what we were doing is they were planting gardens, they were bombing their gardens so they couldn't eat it. But one of the, one of the, the, the interesting missions was to uh, Raval, mm -hmm. which was at one time Yamashita's uh, headquarters. And it was a, we bombed some ships in the harbor there. But, but we weren't attacked, there was very little attack. It was, you know, the Japanese weren't putting up much of resistance and that's kind of why they sent us out. It was because we were kind of in training. But my first mission was to uh, was from Anguar 
to uh, the Philippines, which was called Fort Stotzenberg, which is right next to Clark Field in Manila, ne near Manila. And I remember going there and bombing the fort where the Japanese were. And I, there was no aircraft resist. Yet, I, I'm not sure. We had, we were, yeah, we were attacked by a Tony, but it was no big deal. But there was a lot of aircraft. But on the way, we didn't have enough fuel to get all the way back to the Palau. So we had to stop at Taft Lowman to refuel. And it was still money. And I remember the first mission, or second mission, we did that about three times. There, I saw this, there was this great big pile of, uh, of uh, mail boxes. And, and what I understood was that they were all Christmas presents with the people from the States had sent to the troops. And because they figured, you know, Leite was going to be an easy campaign. Mm -hmm. They were going to have Christmas. And but all these Christmas packages were just sitting there rotting away. And so I often wonder what, what they did with all those Christmas packages. So anyhow, so then after that, then they had taken Manila and they had taken Clark Field. No. Back up. They had, they secured themselves on Leyte and there was an island next to Leyte called Samar. And there was a, uh, there was a, uh, Naval strip on Samar, a Navy. Navy was building a strip on Samar. And I remember we took off from uh, the third mission, I think, from Anguar. We took off and they said, you put all your stuff in your barracks bag, and because you're not coming back here, you're going to Samar after you complete your mission. So uh, we ended up, and they said, right now, the, the strip is only, I forget, 1,200 feet long, but they're still building it. And it says, by the time you guys get off through your mission, the, the strip will be long enough for you to land. <laughs> it wasn't so. In, in eight hours, they had extended the strip that much. They used that the mesh, you know. The, uh -huh. yeah. Now, now let me ask you something. Did you uh, usually fly the same airplane? Did you have one ship assigned? No, that was one thing we did in the Pacific, and because there was a there was a there was a scarcity of planes, trying to keep them up in the air. That you never flew the you flew the same plane, but not every time, mm -hmm. and you didn't necessarily fly with the same crew every time. I mean, at the beginning. Now, were your planes named at all? Yeah, we had lots of good names. Yeah, I got lots of good pictures. We, <laughs> we, yeah, we had this Hollywood artist, his name was Chestnut, and he, 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 he painted the most beautiful women on these airplanes. <laughs> Later, when we got to Okinawa, we had to take all of the, up because it was not nice, you know, because we were not in the jungle anymore. And people, we had people there with the Red Cross girls and everything. Yes. Yeah. yeah, we had, yeah, our planes were all, we all had nose art, and, uh, but I flew in the same plane a lot of times, but not every time. Now, what was its name? Well, we had Liberty Bell, and we had and Liberty Bell II, because Liberty Bell the first got shot down. We had Slightly Dangerous, and uh, oh, geez, Star Eyes, and uh, I can't forget. Now, was your jacket decorated? My what? Your, your flight jacket, did you have the... We didn't have that. Nobody wore insignia, or nobody wore... Bridge, stripes, or anything. Okay. Every, everybody was the same. The only people who wore any insignia were the officers that wore their wings most of the time, but the mm -hmm. rest of us. I don't even think I had my wings when I went overseas. Okay. That were issued now in primary school. Yeah, the only guys that kind of wore their wings were the pilots and, the, and any officers. Mm -hmm. And they didn't make any big deal about it. And they wore their, their, uh, their rank. Their rank, yeah. But, but the enlisted men, no, we, nobody knew who was a sergeant and who wasn't. Of course, we were all sergeants by that time. Yeah. So anyhow, so flew a lot of missions out of uh, Samar, and we lost our commanding officer on Samar. In fact, I was the, uh, we were in the third plane. It was raining like crazy, it was, and, but it was an important mission because it was the first mission, B, first B-24 mission to be, to be flown over to Formosa, which is now Taiwan. And that was a very important mission, and we were happy to, I guess at the time, the. The 22nd Bomber was kind of proud of the fact that we were chosen to bomb the first bombing mission. And so it was raining like hell, and they were, they were thinking of boarding the mission. And we were third in line, and I remember the pilot, which was not my original pilot, we were flying, our, our crew, which was a kind of a green crew, were, were flying with experienced officers. So you just feel mm -hmm. the fact of And because the, our officers were flying with experienced crews, you know, right, just, they didn't just dump you right in. Mm -hmm. And so it was raining, and so I remember I was sitting back with 
you know, when you take off, you're supposed to sit back in the number six bulkhead. And uh, en my engineer, I was the assistant engineer, which had some duties. And he'd come back and tap me on the shoulder. He says, the pilot wants you up here. I said, well, what's the pilot want? He says, he just wants you up here. So, so I got up there, and, and he wanted me to stand between the pilot and co-pilot along with the engineer. And if I guess he just wanted some comfort. It was going to be a bad takeoff. That's what it was all about. Mm -hmm. So then, of course, then I guess we heard the word that we okay for takeoff and saw the plane. And, and the commanding officer was in the first plane because he wanted to be on that first mission. So his name was Robinson. And the reason our bomb group was called the Red Raiders is because he was a Red Raider. I mean, he was a, I forget how that came about. He was a redhead. Mm -hmm. So they called the Red Raiders. Anyway, so they went down the runway and then we, they went out of sight. It was raining so hard. And all of a sudden we heard, boom. And, I mean, for, you saw a flash and boom, three times. And apparently what happened was they got down and they couldn't quite get off the ground. And there was a Navy base, a Navy Corsair sitting down the end of the runway. And they kind of, I guess they kind of weaved one or the other and they caught the Corsair. And they just went over and blown. And then guess they found pieces of the guys. And mm -hmm. They buried it too good. So we lost there. So we didn't fly that day, naturally. But, but the next day, the mission was on again. So we did go back and we bombed. We were the first ones to bomb before us. So that was kind of interesting. That we were in part of history at that time. So and after that, we just flew a few more missions. Then they took, then they took Clark Field. We moved up to Clark Field. I flew most of our missions from Clark Field, mostly to Formosa. Mm -hmm. But we did fly three missions to China. Went to Hong Kong, which was a kind of a hairy mission. We bombed the uh, uh, harbor installations, and that at that time was the first time we dropped napalm. Now this is kind of interesting. I remember this: the napalm was in 55-gallon drums, mm -hmm. which they put up in the bomb bay, and it was attached to the drum was a was a hand grenade, and that was the detonator for the napalm. Kind of scary, isn't it? Of course, that time we. Did. They know what they're doing. Here. So we get up there and we dropped the stuff and what it was, it's supposed to, you know, burn up the whole harbor, burn the poor sand pans and everything else. But that was war, you know. So we dropped it and it did cause a lot of fires. I thought they found was something, I'll tell you. So, uh, no, now I did think, it explode before it hit the hit No, the they water? had a hit. That was the object of the grenade. I guess a grenade will go off, I think, when it hits or something. Okay. I'll wait ahead. And these grenades are just welded to the Five uh, uh, barrels. You know. No, they didn't go. They didn't go off until it hit something. That that, that was the idea of the grenade. Otherwise, okay. the napalm won't go off by itself. Okay. Apparently. So we flew, and then we flew. Uh, then one. Then we, then we were detached down to Palawan, which is an island in the Philippines, to bomb Borneo. Mm -hmm. And Borneo, they still had some oil fields down there that needed taken care of. So we flew. Uh, some real long missions out of paddle line to the southern end of Borneo. And we got attacked a couple of times, but no big deal. Now, did your crew ever shoot down any Japanese planes? No. My crew, I missed the mission because I was, I was in a hospital on Angwar, and they, they did the famous Christmas Day mission over, over, over Clark Field, and I missed that mission because I was in a hospital. And our guys saw more action on that date, I think, than all the other missions put together because there were airplanes all over the place and they were shooting at everybody. And, uh, but our guys never claimed a kill, mm -hmm. but they did a lot of shooting. Mm -hmm. For myself, I never shot on an airplane. Never, never, never. I mean, we, we, they were there, but we, they were never close enough to shoot it. I mean, they never attacked us because we had, the Japanese Air Force was kind of, you know, all done at that time. They were, having, they were lucky to have enough gasoline to get up the air. Mm -hmm. all, all the gasoline was back in, uh, back in Japan, so apparently so they could use it with the kamikaze guys. So anyhow, as far as shooting anybody down, no, 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 we didn't, we didn't shoot too many people. We bombed a lot of people, but that's it, you know, the no, missions no. themselves were. Did you have air, aircraft shot down from the ground? Oh yeah, oh yeah, we had aircraft shot down. Oh yeah, we lost a, we lost a few people. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we lost a few people, yes. Yeah, the first time I saw an airplane shot down, I almost swept my pants, but that's where it goes. You know? mm -hmm. I mean, that's scary. That's not a nice sensation to see some of your buddies. Yeah, that was bad mission. 
Yeah, we had you had you had some shutdown. It wasn't us. We had we had the damage, you know. Mm -hmm. Well, ACAC was our big problem. ACAC and the length of the missions, you know. The missions were all very long. In fact, they were so long that one of our bomb bays carried gasoline. One bomb bay was just was a bomb bay tank in there, which uh, because the missions were so long. And, uh, yeah. But that's what we did. Mm -hmm. that, was the, that was my part of the war. Now, did you get to see any USO shows or any anything like that? Oh, when we got to Clark Field, there was a, we didn't get to see USO shows from the United States, but they had a lot of Philippine entertainment. They had a lot of there were a couple of bands that came to our base, and they were like imitators of Glenn Miller or Xavier Cougar, and they were very good, you know that guy. But we never saw like Bob Hope or anything. Mm -hmm. Also because we didn't get to civilization really until we got to Clark Field. We saw really saw women. Mm -hmm. or, you know, people. Even though we saw some on Lakey, but that was in the jungle. But uh, yeah, well, no, we you know, and, uh, I don't say it, tell you everything. But anyway, we didn't have any U.S. socials. But we did have entertainment in the form of movies uh -huh. and these Philippine entertainment, which was very good. But well, mostly movies was our biggest entertainment. We'd mm -hmm. sit out there in the rain and watch a movie. Now, when you heard that the war ended in uh, Europe. Was there any kind of celebration, or what no, did you guys? No, as I recall, no. I think the biggest event that happened that year was, I mean, it's, 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 you know, as far as the, us was concerned, was Roosevelt dying. We were like, oh my God, what are we going to do? You know, because mm -hmm. we depended on him. He was our father figure. You know, mm -hmm. you know, oh my God, what, who's going to be president? And it was Truman. Who's Truman? You know, yeah. and, and, well, and it ended up he's really my hero, Truman. Really my hero. So anyhow, so no, but then. Uh, the big event was dropping the atomic bomb. I remember we were on Leyte and some guy come running through the, through, the, through the tent area and he said they dropped a bomb on a city and it blew up the whole city. And we're saying, who are you kidding? <laughs> yeah, we're dropping bombs like crazy. And we're looking to knock out a couple of buildings, you know. It, it, it was unbelievable. Yeah. We didn't believe it. We didn't believe it. <coughs> so then we came, I get, well, I guess, and then they said they dropped a second bomb. The war's going to end. They dropped the bomb, yeah, or something. And so, all of a sudden, they said, "Well, they're negotiating." So, in the meantime, we were going to go. We we're going to Okinawa. So we we're going to start bomb, being part of the invasion of Okinawa. But by that time, I had almost all my missions done, you know, but not quite. So they moved me instead of sending me home. They said, "Okay, you got enough. And why send you all the way to Okinawa?" But they needed us. You know, they needed the, to, mm -hmm. they needed the body. So. We went to Okinawa, and uh, but it was kind of, it was as far as we weren't sure whether the Japanese had really given up. They hadn't signed the paper yet, so they sent us what they call an armed reconnaissance mission to Japan, loaded us up with bombs. Okay, they said, okay, here's your targets for second, for primary, secondary. And by that time, I was an old hand, you know, I'm one of the veterans, you know, and I got to fly with all the majors. And so anyhow, uh, they said, if they if open up the bomb bay doors, and if they shoot, drop the bombs. Mm -hmm. And we're looking at each other and says, if they start shooting, we're not going to have a chance to open up the bomb bay doors. <laughs> mm -hmm. You know, that's the, because we're over Japan now, we're mm -hmm. not over somewhere. <clears throat> so we did that, and we opened up our bomb bay doors over a couple targets, and they did not shoot, so we did not drop the bombs. But we saw a lot of sights. Mm -hmm. So we went back, and we, we saw a boat in the ocean, and back and then I flew two more I'm not sure why they let us do that but I flew two more reconnaissance missions to Japan between the time of like the, what they said was a surrender which was the 15th of August until the real surrender which was the 2nd of September mm -hmm. on the battleship of Missouri so it was kind of sightseeing tours mm -hmm. but it was counter as a mission for some reason was there a it's lot to get us another Oak Cleave cluster was there a lot of celebration? I mean, back at the, back at the camp or anything that no, the war was, was over. Just, it was it was like a relief, you know. We're going home. I mean, we I, I knew I was going home if I could live through the we, what we call 100 points, which is in Europe was called the 25, 35 missions. Mm -hmm. I mean, with us, it was points. So many points for so many hours on a mission. So many points for getting getting damaged. So many points for losing an aircraft. So many points for this or this. So if you accumulated 100 points, and if you didn't, if you didn't have any damage or didn't lose any aircraft, you'd have to fly 500 hours. 
to get enough points just for an hour. Mm -hmm. but because you got one point for every five hours. But I didn't only flew 390 some hours, so all the other points we used to call blood points. It was points because you got shot down or something. Mm -hmm. So anyhow, it was an experience these last two reconnaissances, so I got a chance to flow, fly over Hiroshima and see the damage, and Nagasaki, and see that, and that was, and we flew over Tokyo, and that was worse. That was the worst. And the firebombing on Tokyo just did the, the only thing I, we saw that was left kind of was the palace. I remember this very vividly. And, and the pilot pilot took us over Fujiyama. And we flew, the last time was, it was toward the end, it was, I think it was the 31st of August. We flew down to Tokyo Harbor and the Missouri was down there. You know, the mm -hmm. And we yeah. flew right over to Missouri. And we flew, and we flown over Tokyo Harbor. You never saw so many ships in your whole life. The pace was so crowded with ship. So anyhow, so we got back there and then from there they shipped us down to uh, down to Manila, to a replacement depot, which was called, and they said, you go down there and you wait for a boat to go home. Mm -hmm. So I went down there, and we, I guess we were there about a month, or I was there about a month. They even pulled a little KP down there. Even as a sergeant, you pulled Yeah, yeah, it didn't matter if you're a sergeant or not. They needed somebody to pull KP. Everybody was a sergeant. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so we were waiting for a boat, and, uh, or a ship, rather. And uh, I got you, we got into Manila a lot, because we were right outside of Manila. I got to see, uh, you know, walk around, see all the devastation. It was really mm -hmm. bad. It was really bad. And so, we finally, got on a ship. It was called. It was called a Victory ship. It was one of those ships that Henry, what's his name? What's the guy's name? That built all the Ford. No. The built the car. The Henry. No. He built the Liberty ships and the and the other ships, the Victory ships. Mm. West Coast guy. I'll remember. So anyhow, we got in, and we were always on a ship where some, where some enlisted men it was a small ship, and 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 uh, officers and nurses. So the officers had a great time coming back. <laughs> they, were, they were always out on the fan tail, always smooching or something. So that was a long trip. It took us a month to go from Manila all the way to. We we're supposed to go to San Francisco, but there was a strike on it. Sherman, Long Sherman had a strike. So they diverted us up to Portland, and we, they dumped us out of Portland. I remember going, I remember the first time we saw the United States was at night, and we saw the lights. We stayed up all night and watched. So, mm -hmm. And they took us in, of course, in Portland, it's, it, the, it's, it's down the river, the Columbia River. I remember going down to Columbia River, we got out, out and we docked, and there's all these Red Cross people and all these other people said, with milk. It says, what I figure it says, you, you got milk, and of course we hadn't seen milk. Yeah. So that was fun. So we stayed there at Vancouver Barracks, which is across the river from from uh, Portland. And so they finally put us on an air uh, train and uh, back to Camp Dix, and I got discharged on the 4th of December 1945. And you, you were discharged as a sergeant? As a staff sergeant. Yes. Staff sergeant. They wanted me to stay in. They said, uh, we'll give you another strike. And I said, what do I need another strike for? <laughs> and they tried to entice us by staying in. I remember there was all this talk down at Camp Dick says, well, you know, the Air Corps is going to be its own entity at once sometime, and we're going to have nice blue uniforms. They were always already thinking about that. You know? I want to just go home. You know? no. <laughs> I haven't been home in a year and a half. So I anyway, so I remember just being discharged, going over to Grand Central Station, Hopping over to, the, you know, over to it was a tailor shop, and getting all my stripes sewed on and my things, and got some medals, uh, not and ribbons and stuff mm -hmm. that I was that I was about to wear, and I got all you know looked at because all we had, but they just issued those uniforms to us on the day we were discharged. You know? So there, it was some I remember it was other people's names in the back. Yeah, it was old, it were ODs. At the yeah. ODs. So that was great. Then we were, I waited, and that was all by myself. I waited and. Grand Central Station for a train. Took the train up to Amsterdam, and I remember he said, Amsterdam, Amsterdam, next stop, Amsterdam. I remember back when I first went in the got inducted in the sermon, drafted. There were 10,000 people at the, at the railroad station. And when I got off, after the war, there were two people at the railroad station. 
mother and the father. Mm -hmm. So that's the way it was. And that was December 1945. The war had already been over for four months. Mm -hmm. yeah, okay, uh, at that point... That's a long story. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> Why did you get me into this? <laughs> Now at that point, did I'm not a hero, by the way. <laughs> well, I think all you guys were. Now, did you make use of the GI Bill at all? You betcha. I always wanted to go to college. My folks always wanted me to go. Of course, we were, you know, we weren't rich. We were poor. I mean, you know, whatever. We were. Uh, we, there was no middle class in those days, but, but I was wanted. My one aunt was uh, was my favorite aunt, and she wanted me to go. But they had promised, even when I was back in high school, that you're going to go to college. And, and we had figured out my folks would pay for one year, my aunt would pay for another year, and somehow I would get through. Because, you know, I, I was okay in school. I, was, mm -hmm. I wasn't the brightest kid in the world, but I had some smarts. But the GI Bill, oh my God, here's the chance to go to college, you know. So, yes, I did. I, I won't tell you everything, but I ended up at Syracuse University. I got my degree in uh, civil engineering and uh, went out from there. Now, did you get any credits for the, that five months you spent at Syracuse? In that oh, for, as, far as, the, as far as the university was concerned? Yeah. No. no. In fact, I lost it. I, what I did, right after World War II, the, there were so many guys who wanted to go to college, they didn't have enough room. So the state of New York came up with this scheme, they called it the Associated Colleges of Upper New York. And there were two year schools. There was one in Samson Air Base, one in and one at the Utica at the base there, and one up in Plattsburgh, Theo Plattsburgh Barracks. And so they call them the Champlain College in Plattsburgh, and Utica College, and Samson College. And they were part of what they call the Associated Colleges of Upper New York. Mm -hmm. And so I went up to, and I was already, I had already applied to the University of, uh, of uh, Washington University in St. Louis, because they had good simple and civil engineering curriculum. And I was already going out there, and I was in a bar with one of my friends that I was in the service with, or, well, in high school with. And he said, well, why don't you come up to Plattsburgh at Champlain College? You know, we're all going up there. He said, oh, Jim, wait, where are we going? Oh, it's close to home. You know, it's not bad. So they talked me into it, so I applied, and a week later they accepted me. And so we went up to Plattsburgh, and I spent two years up there at, at Plattsburgh. At, at, it was called pre-engineering, mm -hmm. or then you could take other courses. But there was a course called pre-engineering, and from there, you would take your credits and you could apply to RPI or Clarkson or mm -hmm. Syracuse or whoever would take it. So I spent two years, in fact, that's where I met my wife, and we got married up there. And so she was going to the teacher school. They used to call them state teacher's college. Mm -hmm. that, that wasn't SUNY. So anyhow, and then uh, I got accepted at Syracuse, but when I got to Syracuse, well, I, I wanted to go to Clarkson. But they wouldn't accept all the, no, they wouldn't mm -hmm. accept all the courses for some reason. And RPI was another one, which I was kind of a second, but they were too filled up. So, but Syracuse was taken, like most everybody. And they were, there was a very good program they had there. So I went to, so I got accepted at Syracuse. But they still didn't accept every course. Mm -hmm. But then, so it ended up, when I got to my senior year, I, I, I had enough, I had enough, I had all the required courses, but not enough credits. Mm -hmm. actually, so I took courses like bacteriology and uh, advanced structural design and all that, just to get my credit sure. to graduate. So I graduated in '51. We were married, and uh, my our second child was on the way then. And I did a job at the state for a year, and I went to General Electric Company. And for the most part, I worked with GE all my life, except for one year. We went out to California, and I worked for Lockheed, mm -hmm. but we weren't happy out there, so we came. And so GE was very good to me. I retired from GE in 1985 as a project manager. So it was, I had a good career. I, I, I was lucky. Okay. Uh, what is luckier than hell? Did you stay in contact with any of the guys you flew with? Some of the guys. One of the guys, Johnny Martin, was from, he was our tail uh, nose gunner. And he was from Brooklyn. I uh, used to keep in contact with him. He was one of the old guys on the crew. He was like 28. He and the pilot were the oldest guys on the crew. Nice guy, nice Irishman. And I remember he was so, he was the religious guy in the crew. You always got to have one religious guy in there. And he wrote to his mother and his girlfriend every day. But his girlfriend really wasn't his girlfriend. It was a girl that he was trying to woo, you know. Uh -huh. She was a little bit younger than us. But he was 20 and so. I remember we used to, I went down a couple of times. We hit a couple of the bars in Brooklyn before I got married. So I said, I 
was still, I was going to school. In fact, I'd go down there and visit with them. And so, but then the other guys, I kind of lost touch. I, mean, I didn't really. One of the guys died uh, from a brain hemorrhage. He was from uh, Milwaukee or shortly, uh, shortly after he got back. And the other guys, I don't know. One, one of my co pilot was from Oneida. And, I, I, and four or five years ago, I got in touch with his, his daughter put a, put a message on our website. And I sent some email to her, and I wanted to go out. He lived at Oneida, mm -hmm. and he was retired. I always wanted to go out there, and I never did. I don't talk about old times, but, but I never, I'm not sure he's still alive. But I remember, I remember Johnny Martin, my friend, I was in college, and I got a letter from him one day. He says, what the hell is it? Oh, Catholic, Catholic, Catholic. He says, I finally married my Catholic. Even wooing this girl. Yeah. <laughs> and that was, that was big. That was all his letters said. <laughs> and I see the Christmas card from him. He said, then, I, then he died. Yeah. And that's about it. Yeah. Did you uh, join any veterans organizations? No, I didn't. I, I'm, not, I'm not sure why not. I just was against, I'm not against it. I just mm -hmm. was not a joiner. And but one of the friends, I just met him the other day, and down in Ashton, they were, there was the Ambets. You know the Ambets? That was just mm -hmm. starting up at that time. And there was this guy, he was in the service, and he was trying to drum up uh, membership in the Ambets. And I remember we were at the bar, we hung out to, at this bar in, uh, in Amsterdam, and he used to come in, come on, you want to join? No, oh, we want to join. Most, most of us didn't join. But the Ambets is a big organization to me. Mm -hmm. And the guy that's the, the head of it around here is a guy by the name of Kanapik, I don't know if you know him. Yeah. B.J. Kanapik, and he lives down in Glenville someplace, and he's a big monkey monk. And I met him the other day. He came into the uh, into the center, and he had all these patches on, you know, for the ambulance. But I never joined. No, I didn't. I didn't. I'm not. I wasn't a joiner. Did you attend any reunions at all? Or I attended my first and only. Oh, did it go? No. Yeah, well, first and only bomb group reunion which was the 50th anniversary, and it was held at Langley Field, Virginia, where the Bond Group was first organized in 1941. So that's where the Bond Group started. They took off from Langley Field to go to the Pacific. Mm -hmm. and at that time, they had B-26s, and they flew across the country and over to New Guinea, and that's where they were mm -hmm. in New Guinea for a long time. And uh, they converted from our, they, they had to solve a lot of action with B-26s, my Bond Group. Then they converted to B-25s, which they only had for a little while. Then they converted to heavies, which was B-24s, and that's when I joined them. Okay. So, I, uh, but so, you know, I didn't keep tabs. I, 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 I looked up the names of all the guys that were on my crew, and to the best of my knowledge, they're all dead. Okay. Except myself, and maybe, I'm not sure about my co-pilot lives in, in, uh, oh, in Oneida. I should look that up. I know, but the rest of them are dead. I know they are. Okay. How do you think your time in the service changed or affected your life? You mentioned you probably wouldn't have been able to afford to go to well, college. Well, first, it was, yeah, it was, you know, there's all good things that comes out, come out of that, you know, sometimes. They kind of sell them, mm -hmm. my college education. And, yeah, that was a big thing. You know, without that, I could probably wouldn't have gone to college. I would probably ended up working in the mill like my father did and just become an ordinary... Maybe I would. Maybe I would have gone to college. Maybe not. I don't know. If I, I may, I, I may have been motivated enough to go to college on my own and get a job or pay my own way. Mm -hmm. I would have had to pay my own way through if the war didn't, you know, do that. But it was an experience that I didn't forget. But, but, but we for, kind of forgot about it. Yet. Nobody talked about it. I mean, all the guys from my classes in, in college. I mean, we're all in service, but nobody said, "Where were you? What did you do?" To that, to that, to that. You know, we never talked about. it. No, mm -hmm. no. And I kind of have a theory about it. it. Well, maybe later I had a theory about that. I mean, it was too much at the time to theories. I think a lot of us kind of felt guilty that how come I'm here and these other guys are mm -hmm. in the ocean are buried somewhere. But I don't know if that's true or not. I've heard some guys say that. Mm -hmm. There's a little bit of a guilt there. But, but it was something. You know, I, you know, in retrospect, uh, I wouldn't have missed it. <laughs> I wouldn't have missed the war, but you know, you can't tell the Russians that there are too many people killed. Yeah. 
You know, the, you know the Russian people really suffered during World War II. You know, they can't pin down whether there were 20 million people killed or 30 million people killed. Now, you can't zero it in within 10 million. Yeah. I mean, that's amazing. Yeah, but war is hell. I mean, it's really horror I, mean, I mean, these people want to go, let's go to Afghanistan and get those old ragheads and all that. Hey, man, you're sending people over there to get killed, you know? Mm -hmm. that, you know, you're not sending them over there to get a bunch of medals and coming home and while marching a parade. Some of those guys are going to get killed, mm -hmm. and, and ladies and females, too, as, yeah. as has happened. I mean, don't be talking more to me, baby. If you want to go fight a war, you put the pants on, bro. You're talking more because you're going to send some minority over there to fight the war for you. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure all minority people go, but there are a lot of minorities go. Sure. It's, well, it's a way out for them, you know. Minorities uh, have a tough time, you know, in this world. They either become basketball players or join the army. Which is a way, you know, way for them to advance. I shouldn't say they, they us. But uh, don't be telling me we got to go over to Iran and spank, spank somebody's behind. If somebody's going to get killed, mm -hmm. it might be your brother. So I'm anti-war. I'm really anti-war. All right. Well, thank you for your interview. Is that a good interview? Excellent. <laughs>